Predicting social change routinely foils forecasters of all kinds, leaving people blindsided and unprepared for major changes in society. So today, we're going to do our best to change that by showing you a better way to understand, anticipate, and even capitalize on social change through a theory called socionomics. It's a perspective so profound yet elegantly simple that even a child can understand it and apply it. So today, we'll introduce socionomics to a seven-year-old and then to a young adult, and finally, we'll talk about the theory with an expert. In each case, you'll see how you can use socionomics to see the world, forecast, and make decisions. You'll even get a taste of how you can use the perspective to spot risks and capitalize on opportunities before just about anyone else sees them coming. So if you want to get an edge in your marketplace, be a sharper strategist, or a more informed decision maker, then let's get started and learn about this powerful perspective. Landon, thank you so much for coming in today. Mm -hmm. Now, let's get to know you a little bit. How old are you? Seven. You are seven. Okay. Mm -hmm. And do you have any uh, hobbies? What do you like to do for fun? Um, Beyblades. Beyblades. Awesome. Those are, those are a lot of fun. Uh, play any sports, martial arts, things like that? Um, I know martial arts and I'm almost black belt. You're almost a black belt. That's amazing. Well, we're going to try to get you to your black belt in socionomic decision making today and maybe have a little fun along the way. Now, Lyndon, if I told you that we were going to be talking about the socionomic theory of social causality, that would sound like a big mouthful, huh? Kind of complicated. Yes. Yeah. Well, we're going to break it all down because at its core, it's really just about how the way we feel influences what we do. Mm -hmm. And Landon, if you can master this perspective, then when you grow up, you can use it to maybe just maybe make a big pile of money. Sound good? Mm -hmm. All right. Well, we're going to fire up the big board and jump right in. Okay. Okay, Landon, if I were to mm -hmm. tell you that someone was in a positive mood, any idea yeah. what that might mean? Positive mood means that you're positive that mm -hmm. you're going to do something right. Hey, that's and right, yeah. Positive mood, that mood that me means that you're happy. Yes. And you can express yourself to show that you're happy. Absolutely. Yeah. Positive mood. You're feeling good. It's a good mood. You're nailing this, Landon. And yes. if I were to tell you someone was in a negative mood... It means that they're angry and mad at someone. That's exactly right. So we've got positive mood. That's the good mood. Negative mood. Not such a good mood. <laughs> exactly. You are a natural. All right, Landon. Now let's play a matching game. So we have six faces on the screen here. Mm -hmm. And Landon, I'm going to hand this iPad to you and ask you to please circle the faces that match positive mood. Okay? Okay. All right. Terrific. And I'll take that back from you. Fantastic. So Landon, you've circled these three faces to match with positive mood, and mm -hmm. I imagine that means you're going to tell me that the other three faces match with... Negative mood. Negative mood. That is exactly right. Let's make sure. We'll do a little drum roll on your knees there. Boom! You nailed it. Well done, Landon. You are really getting the hang of this. So Landon, let's do a thought experiment, mm -hmm. okay? Let's imagine that your whole class mm -hmm. at school is in a positive mood. Can mm -hmm. you imagine that? They're happy, they're feeling good. Yep. Now, Landon, not just your whole class. Let's imagine your whole school, your whole town, maybe the whole country in a positive mood. Yes. Whoa! Now, Landon, let's imagine another country where the people were in a negative mood, okay? Now, Landon, in which of these two countries are people going to smile more? That positive mood country. Mm -hmm. In which country are the people going to be more sad? Down there, the negative mood. Linda, which country is going to have people more hopeful and optimistic about the future? Totally, because if you're in a positive mood, you're not just feeling good about the present. You think the future is going to be positive too, of course. Yes. Landon, in which country do you think people might fight with each other more often? That. 
down there, the negative mood. And which country do you think people are going to get along and be pretty peaceful? Yeah. Awesome. So from what you're telling us, Landon, it sounds like if we know if the country is in a positive mood or a negative mood, not only do we know how they're feeling, but we also can predict some things that people in that country might do. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, Landon, this presents a bit of an opportunity, okay? Because mm -hmm. our mood not only influences what we do, it influences what the people in that country would be interested in buying. Mm -hmm. Okay, you see where this might be going? So Landon, let's imagine that you are in business. Mm -hmm. You are the owner of a car company. <laughs> in fact, we need to put you in the right attire for this. We've got a driving helmet for you. Let's, let's stick this on there. Oh, excellent. Perfect. Now, Landon, in your car company, you want to make not necessarily the cars that you want to drive, but the cars the that all the people, people want, want to drive. drive. Yeah? And if you can do that, then everyone's going to want to buy your car. You could have riches, maybe a big mansion, you name it. <laughs> okay? And the way you're going to do this, Landon, is by matching the cars you produce to the mood that the country's in. So, Landon, when people are in a positive mood, they want to drive faster cars, mm -hmm. bigger cars, more powerful, more fun, brightly colored. Yes. And when they're in a negative mood, they want to drive the small, less powerful, maybe not quite as fun cars, okay? All right, so Landon, here we go. We've got two cars on the screen. Tell me which one you're going to produce when the mood is positive. That one. The top. Why are you going to make the top car? Because if people are in a positive mood, People want to buy those cars. They want to buy them. People are in a yeah. ne negative mood. They want to buy those cars. They absolutely do, Landon. So here's what's going to happen. You're going to produce that top car when mood is positive. You're going to produce the bottom car when mood is negative. Let's see if you got this right. Boom! You did, Landon. Now, we don't have any money for you to make today, but we have something that might be even a little bit better. You want to know what it is? Hmm. All right. We have M&M's. Yes. All right, Landon. So this is kind of like your yellow belt in becoming a socionomic decision-making yes. master. Here you go. Hold <laughs> on to those. All right, you're getting the hang of this. I think we need to raise the stakes. Because, Landon, not only are you the owner of a car company, you are also a famous music producer. What? Oh, we got to get you some music producer shades. <laughs> oh, yeah. In fact, I'll take that helmet from you and you'll slide these on. Oh, great. <laughs> oh, you are really looking the part now. All right, Landon. Well, as a music producer, you want to do exactly the same thing you did with your car company. Yes. You want to make the music that the people are in the mood to listen yes. to. Absolutely. If they're in a negative mood, they want to listen to that kind of music. What kind of music do you think that is? That is sad music. Yeah. Or that one, on the other hand, is happy music. Yeah, so they want to listen to the happy music yeah. when they're feeling good. When they're feeling good, when they're in that good mood, and they want to listen to that angry, sad music when they're in the negative mood, right? Negative, yes. You are nailing this, Landon. Well, let's see how this worked out for you. You produce that top artist when mood's positive, that bottom artist when mood is negative, and Boom, you nailed it and landed. And this is exactly what we see in history. When mood is positive, people like this happy, fun, upbeat music. And when it's negative, they prefer that angry, sad, more pessimistic stuff. Oh, wow. Well, you know what this means, Landon? You've made some more M&Ms. <laughs> You've graduated to your red belt in socionomic decision making. Hold on to that. But Landon, there's more. What is the highest belt? Black belt. The black belt is next. That's right, because Landon, not only are you a famous music producer, not only do you own a car company, you are also a Hollywood director. Oh, and we've got something just for you. You know, those directors, they're always wearing these fancy berets. So let's put this on. I'll take the glasses from you. Excellent. We have our director in the house. Terrific. Now, Landon, 
as a director. It's the same thing you've done before. You want to make those positive movies when the mood is positive, when social mood's negative, you want to make those negative mood movies. All right, it's going to be tricky. It's going to be like the faces. I'm going to show you six characters, and I want you to circle the three that you're going to produce when mood is positive. Are you ready? Yeah. All right, we've got Mickey Mouse. All right, yes, one more. Fantastic, I'll take the iPad back from you, Landon. Talk to me about these three that you circled. Why were those positive mood because movies? Because they're all smiling. They're all smiling. And even Dory and Nima. Absolutely, yeah. These are positive, kind of upbeat movies, and people mm -hmm. are going to want to see those when they're in the positive mood. Yeah. Now, what about these other characters here? What kind of mood is this? Negative. This is the negative mood. So you're going to make those movies when mood is negative, and the other movies you've circled when mood is positive. Did you nail it? Absolutely, you did, Landon. You have earned your black belt in socionomic decision making. Wow, what a day. Landon, I think you are well on your way to being a multimedia, multi-industry business tycoon. Now, before I give this to you, Landon, let's wrap things up. What have we learned today about the boot of the country and how we can use it to make decisions? Well, if everybody in the entire world is happy, we have to make stuff that looks happy and feels happy. If, if, if everybody was in a negative mood, we'd make negative movies, negative songs, all sorts of stuff. That's exactly right, Landon. Well, all we need now is a way to measure mood so we know if it's positive or if it's negative, and we're gonna learn how to do that when we meet Megan, a young professional in our next segment. Landon, you've earned it. You're black belt in socionomics. Thank you so much for helping us out today. You're welcome. Megan, I'm Matt. Nice to meet you. Matt, nice to meet you. Absolutely. Let's get to know you a little bit. So okay. you're a young professional. What are you doing these days? Yeah, so I um, do social media marketing for a finance-related company. Um, so that keeps me busy, along with some other side jobs. Yeah, okay. Well, it sounds like you're staying busy. Very cool. Oh, yeah. Well, today, Megan, we're going to be talking about socionomic theory. And it may sound like a complicated term, but really it's all about the relationship between social mood, okay. the mood of a country, and what people in that society are likely to do. And we think about this relationship between social mood and social behavior in socionomics mm. totally different from the way that everybody else does it. So if you're up for it, we'll fire up the big board and get started. I'd love to. Okay, so Megan, on this slide we see some headlines. Mm -hmm. Can you read that top headline for us? Japan stocks fall, yen keeps funds in bearish mood. And a bearish mood is just a negative mood, a pessimistic mood. Mm -hmm. So here comes a pop quiz. According to this headline, why did the mood become more negative? Yeah, so according to the headline, the Japan stocks fell which the effect of that was the bearish mood. That's exactly right. And we can look at some others. Uh, retail stocks fall. Oil prices put a dent in the mood. What's the presumed cause and effect relationship mm -hmm. here? Um, so like the first one, the cause was the retail stocks fell. And then the effect was that oil prices dented the mood. Yeah. And Megan, this is an idea that we see all the time. This idea that financial events, economic events, political events were more broadly, social events mm -hmm. influence the tenor and character of social mood. This is precisely the sentiment we tend to see in the financial press. It's also precisely the sentiment we tend to see in the academic press, Megan. And in our view, it is precisely backwards. Mm -hmm. In socionomics, we look at how social mood influences the tenor and character of social events. We start with that psychology because those events have to come from somewhere. And they come from people who have feelings. So if you know how they're feeling, then you've got a leg up on anticipating what they're going to do. Mm -hmm. So that presents a pretty cool opportunity because what it means is that if we had a way to measure or track the social mood, say the mood of a country, then we could predict the kinds of social behaviors and social trends that are going to unfold. Mm -hmm. 
But in order to do that, we've got to have a way to track mood. Mm. Megan, we find the absolute best way to track social mood, the mood of an entire society, is the stock market. And that's because the stock market is a venue where people have been expressing their changes in mood, their changes in optimism and pessimism for generations. So we have the data going back centuries for some countries, so we can back test the theory. And as long as the stock market's open, we get real-time updates as well. So when we see a stock market price chart, if we see those prices rising, it's an indication to us that social mood's becoming more positive. Mm -hmm. And if we see prices falling, it's an indication that that mood's becoming more negative. Not because the market's causing it to go one way or the other, it's mm -hmm. just people are becoming more optimistic, becoming more positive, and they're expressing that mood by, say, sending stock prices higher. Mm -hmm. But Megan, they express their mood in a variety of other ways. And we're going to look at one that might be quite profound. So Megan, here we see a chart of stock prices going back to 1695. So we have more than 300 years of data on this chart. Wow. And you can see that there are periods where prices are generally rising, so mood's becoming more positive, reaching that positive extreme, and then trending in the opposite direction, mood becoming more negative, reaching a negative extreme at some of those low points in the market. Mm -hmm. Now, Megan, let's think about war and peace mm -hmm. in social mode. When would you expect society to be the most peaceful? I mean, I would definitely associate peace to when they're more positive. Okay, so we would expect to see these periods of peace falling. Where would you say on the chart? Um, I would definitely be seeing like peaceful trends and positivity, like where it's going very high up and shooting that way. Okay, so when it's going up and probably near those positive extremes, mm -hmm. when mood is the most positive. Now let's think about war and conflict. Would you expect that to happen when mood was quite positive or quite negative? Very negative. <laughs> that would be more of a negative mood mm -hmm. manifestation, of course. And where on the chart then would you expect to see those periods of conflict and war? Yeah, you'd see them where they are dipping down. So, I mean, even starting all the way at the beginning of the graph, there's mm -hmm. a dip, so mm -hmm. all the dips. Sure, you'd expect those to be environments where society may not get along as well and might even go to war. Mm -hmm. All right, Megan, well, you've just laid out a hypothesis to explain more than 300 years of war and peace. Wow. Let's see how you do. <laughs> not so bad. Like you said, near these positive extremes, that's when we're seeing the peace. And toward the ends of these dips, these negative mood extremes, that's when conflict is more likely to erupt. Hmm. Now, Megan, scholars have been studying this question and trying to figure out why society goes through these phases of war and peace for generations. And here, just by knowing about socionomics for a few minutes, you've been able to come up with an explanation that rather elegantly explains more than 300 years of history. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Now, Megan, let's move on and talk about why mood might change. Now, we have studied every explanation for why social mood would change that we've ever heard, and none of them hold up. So the explanation that's the most consistent with the data is that mood is what we call psychologically endogenous, which is just a fancy way of saying it does its own thing, it marches to the beat of its own drum. Mm -hmm. And we think we know what that beat is. It's described by the Elliott Wave model, We've got an Elliott Wave five-wave impulse on the screen. Now, we don't have time to dig into the full model. We've got another video series on that. You can check it out and learn all about it. But all I want you to understand today, Megan, is that from extremes, either positive or negative, trends in the opposite direction unfold. So let's imagine, Megan, that in real time, you diagnose that society is up by that number five. Okay, we're up by this positive extreme. Mm -hmm. I'm going to give the iPad to you, Megan, and I want you to just draw an arrow in the direction that you expect the trend to go next. Okay. Okay. Okay, and you've drawn a downward sloping arrow. You would expect from this positive extreme for the trend to then go in the opposite direction. Mm -hmm. So Megan, let's think for a moment. You're making a series of forecasts in that <laughs> one arrow because you're saying that you expect 
the stock market to go lower. You expect social mood to become more negative. Now let's think back to war and peace. What would you expect for the climate of conflict here in the future? Yeah, I mean, with it going down, that would mean that there would have to be something negative in the world. You'd expect some kind of conflict risk mm -hmm. to be there. And what's interesting is that at this point, though, when you're at that positive extreme, are things going to be peaceful or are they going to be laden with conflict? Um, I mean, it's going to be peaceful until it becomes negative again. That's right. So you're yeah. at this period where there's peace, there's prosperity, but mm -hmm. yet you're able to see around the corner right. and anticipate this change in trend. Now, Megan, let's imagine you are the national security advisor for a country. And you're up there by that five. You're up there at that positive mood extreme. And I come to you and I say, Megan, you know all those countries we've been fighting with for like a thousand years? Well, my gosh, we're getting along with them so well now. Why don't we all get together and form a union? You see any risks that might be associated with that? Um, I could see risk because that's not going to last forever. So forming a union in theory sounds good, but what will most likely end up happening is there'll be more conflict and it won't go well. <laughs> it seems like more conflict right around the corner yeah. based on that arrow that you've drawn. Well, Megan, let's take a look at what a group of countries actually did at one of those positive mood extremes. Okay. Okay, Megan, so in the 1990s, a bunch of countries in Europe who had been fighting for who knows how many centuries were getting along. They said, hey, let's get together and we'll form a monetary union. We'll share the same currency. We'll have a continent-wide central bank and we'll just get along forever and ever. And what are they doing? Well, they're at this height of this positive mood trend and they're extrapolating. Mm -hmm. They're saying, hey, things are going great now. They'll go great forever. But Megan, you were able to foresee a pretty significant risk involved in doing this. So mm -hmm. let's see how this decision worked out. Almost immediately, Europe entered a decades-long negative wow. mood trend. And as you predicted, there have been all kinds of conflicts and disagreement and strife between these countries. One of them left the Union not too long ago. And we'll see what happens as this negative mood trend continues to unfold. Now, Megan, the best and brightest leaders of Europe did not foresee this risk, but you know about socionomics, and so you were able to see it coming. Kind of cool. <laughs> now, Megan, I don't want you going home today and saying it was interesting, but I'm not a national security advisor to a country in Europe, so how could I use this stuff? So here's the takeaway for just an everyday investor or an everyday engaged citizen. Mm -hmm. And that is when you see a major event like this, it's a signal that that mood trend is probably quite mature. And it's time to start looking for a trend in the opposite direction, which is going to impact the financial markets, mm -hmm. the economy, politics. So if you can see it coming, you can prepare for it and get ready. You won't be totally blindsided like all these European leaders were. All right, Megan, let's look at one more example. I understand you might have an interest in fashion and clothing. I do. Perfect. Well, let's talk about trends in fashion. That sounds great to me. Awesome. So here we have a chart of stock prices mm -hmm. and some clothing styles that were popular at various points along the way. So on top, we have three fashion styles that were popular near positive mood extremes. And on the bottom, we have some styles that were popular near negative mood extremes. Mm -hmm. Now, do you notice any differences between these two groups? I do, yeah. Um, so all the ones on the bottom that were in negative moods, they all have very dark clothes on. Um, they're all long. So I'm sure that's just to reflect how they felt. And then the top ones are all colorful. They look more happy and fun. Absolutely. Well, Megan, you've gotten the hang of this. You're nailing it. So to <laughs> it helps that it's fashion. Yes. So. <laughs> well, this is totally in your wheelhouse. Mm -hmm. So what we're going to ask you to do now, Megan, is I'm going to hand this iPad back to you and I'm going to ask you if you could please sketch a positive mood fashion design and a negative mood fashion design. Are you up for that? I think I can do it. Let's do it. <laughs> okay. Here you are using socionomics to design your own fashion line. This is fantastic. Oh, great. And doing it in record time, too. Now, if it's not too much trouble, could you maybe color it in? Yes. Perfect. I already got my black going. Great. It's a little harder with this small pen. Absolutely. You're doing a great job. 
I think you can tell that dress is colored in. <laughs> yes. Okay, cool. <laughs> it's definitely different. Put in some stripes on this skirt. Okay, absolutely. <laughs> Embellish it a little bit. So we'll do some little polka dots. Ooh, fun. Don't show this to any fashion designers yet. <laughs> okay. All right. Megan, this is terrific. Tell us a little bit about this positive mood design. Yeah, so with what I had, um, the one on the left with the positive mood, I just chose um, an orange yellow color just because it's happy, reflects the sun. And so she has a like a knee length skirt um, and a tank top. So it's like lighter clothes, lighter wear. She's feeling happier. And then on the negative mood, she's wearing a long black dress, like all the way down to her feet. Um, so that would mean that it's a darker time. Um, most women too, when they're going through harder times, um, they tend to, to hide their bodies and not show things. So you can tell between both that the lady on the left is like showing her legs and she's not really showing much of anything. Okay, yeah, you've got these contrasting designs that you've put mm -hmm. together to match these two different moods. Mm -hmm. Well, terrific, Megan, let's wrap things up. What have we learned today about social mood and how we can use it to understand the world around us and make decisions? Yeah, well, I think just everything you shared with me, um, there's always a cause and effect. And so with social moods, we know that when there is one positive extreme that a negative is soon to follow. So we can prepare in advance by knowing the cause and effect of both and that as soon as there's a positive trend, we know what's following and that's gonna be a more negative trend. Sure, if you can identify the mood trend and particularly where you are within that trend, then you have an idea about what's going to come next and you can mm -hmm. make decisions accordingly, whether those are decisions in yeah. business as you've shown us here or in politics and right. in even more areas of the social world that we'll learn about when we meet Alyssa, our expert in the next segment. Megan, thank you so much for coming in today. You're welcome and thank you for helping me know how to make my next fashion design. I'll predict it. Perfect. <laughs> Sounds good. Alyssa, thank you so much for speaking with us today. Thanks for having me, Matt. Absolutely. Now, you've served as the executive director of the Socionomics Institute. You've been the editor of the Socionomist. What was it that first piqued your interest about socionomics. What was it that drew you to the perspective? Sure, you know, socionomics initially caught my interest because it's such a simple yet powerful proposition that our moods affect our actions. You know, we're all taught the opposite, right? That actions and events affect our mood. But when you think about it, it makes sense that our actions have to come from somewhere and they come from what we're feeling. So to me, that just clicked immediately. You know, and ever since then, I view the world through this lens, whether I'm watching the news or scanning social media, you know, once you get socionomics, it's really hard to go back to the old way of viewing things. Well, it's such a powerful perspective and it's useful. Could you talk a little bit more about the utility side? Sure, you know, that's one of the things I love most about socionomics. You know, it's not some sort of in the clouds theory of social behavior. It's hugely applicable to every person in every walk of life. You know, we really can call it the every man science. So every person can apply it to their own finances, uh, social situation, you know, career, really use it as a way to, to view the world and make decisions. And I actually brought along one of my favorite diagrams here to make that point. Let's take a look. Cool, let's do it. So this diagram comes from Robert Prechter's book, The Wave Principle of Human Social Behavior. And when I was first learning the science of socionomics, this is really what produced the aha moment for me, you know, the point where I finally got it. And it shows a list of positive social expressions here on the left associated with positive mood and negative social expressions on the right associated with negative mood. And so during periods of positive social mood, we see more traits and behaviors characterized by these on the left and vice versa. So if you think about just how useful this information might be for someone that's looking to, you know, run for office, for example, maybe on what message, you know, or someone that's looking to start their own advertising agency, or even someone looking to emigrate to another country and trying to decide when attitudes might be more conducive to them doing that, you know, it's really hugely useful stuff. Yeah, you know, what to expect and how much of it. Of course, there's always a mix of social expression, but when mood is quite positive, then you would expect to see more and more extreme expressions of that positive mood relative to negative mood, and vice versa when mood is quite negative. 
Now, Alyssa, today we've seen so many examples of how we can use the stock market as an indicator of social mood to understand trends in pop culture and business, even peace and war. But it turns out that social mood influences us in so many ways, and it even impacts our health. I think you have an example of that to show us. That's right. Yeah. You know, Matt, it might surprise you, but it appears that social mood influences our susceptibility to epidemic disease. So take a look at this chart. It comes from our 2009 monthly magazine, The Socionomist. And it shows that all of the epidemics in the 20th century hit near the ends of these you know, major declines in the market, whether they were big or long declines. Uh, that includes encephalitis lethargica, Spanish flu, polio, and AIDS. They really all show this similar pattern. And you know, since then, we've looked at other epidemics around the globe. And again, they show this similar pattern. So it's really fascinating. You know, take a look at this next chart. This shows the 2019-2020 coronavirus outbreak. And the, the virus actually emerged in China at the end of 2019, which was 12 years into a major bear market in the country. And you can see on the chart, there's other viruses that have hit the, the country as well, you know, all at the end of these kind of, you know, declines in the market or at major lows. And so it's really fascinating, Matt. And when you think about just how useful this information could be for epidemiologists, you know, governments, even just individuals, you and me. You know, things like knowing when to stock up on masks before there's going to be a mask shortage, or when to book that overseas trip, or maybe even cancel such a trip. You know, it's really valuable knowledge. Absolutely. You can use it to make decisions. And I understand the next example you have for us has to do with decision making in politics. That's right. You know, our group has done a lot of research in this area, but one of the findings that's been super interesting to me personally is that women seem to make political inroads during periods of negative social mood. So, for example, take a look at this chart. You know, it shows a dozen political firsts for women in U.S. political offices. And you can see that each one of them made their breakthrough near the end of a, a major decline in stocks when negative mood was near an extreme. Yes, it's a fascinating chart. In fact, let's dive into it a little bit. In 1917, the first woman was elected to the House of Representatives. So this is coming 17 years into what would be a 20 year period of negative social mood. Women won the right to vote in 1920, right at the low. And then a couple years after that, the first female was appointed to the US Senate. And then after the next significant dip in the market in 1924, there was the first female governor, the first female mayor of a major city. And then during the roaring bull market of the 1920s, these female firsts became more difficult to come by. But after mood turned more negative, there was a stock market crash. And right at the low in 1932, the first woman was elected to the US Senate. The following year, we saw the first female presidential cabinet secretary. Then yet again, a major bull market, and again, a more difficult time having these major female firsts. But during the next significant negative social mood trend clustering around that negative extreme starting in 1979, another slew of significant female firsts. In 1981, there was the first female Supreme Court justice. A few years after that, there was the first female vice presidential candidate. Right, and we've seen the same pattern, you know, even in recent events. Take a look at 2002, you know, the market was nearing the end of a big decline there. The Nasdaq, for example, lost 78% of its value, which is just a really stunning number. And just two months after the market bottomed in October 2002, Nancy Pelosi was elected House Minority Leader, making her the highest ranking U.S. Congresswoman ever. Of course, that position defaulted to Speaker of the House in January 2007 when her party gained a majority in Congress. But she really attained that party leadership position back at that 2002 low. And then zooming forward to 2008, Hillary Clinton became the first woman to win a U.S. presidential primary. Of course, she did nab the Democratic Party nomination in 2016. Uh, that timing diverged a little bit than the rest on the chart because she, you know, we weren't in a major bear market at that point. We did have a minor pullback. So we might say that was a little bit early. But you know, bottom line, women, if you're looking to run for office, watch the market for your best opportunity. Alyssa, it's fascinating stuff. And today we've just scratched the surface of the dozens of ways that we've shown in The Socionomist and in our books that we can use this perspective to understand the world around us, see around the corner and make decisions. Yeah, that's right, Matt. Like you said, it's a fascinating science and one that'll make you a more capable decision maker in a lot of areas of your life. There you have it. You've seen a child use socionomics to make business decisions in the automobile, music, and movie industries. 
you've watched as a young adult use the theory to account for 300 years of trends in war and peace, foresee risks attending a major geopolitical event that some of the world's best and brightest leaders missed in real time, and design a fashion line calibrated to trends and social mood. Finally, you saw an expert show you how to anticipate the emergence of epidemics and to spot windows of opportunity for breakthroughs for women in politics. And there's so much more you can do with socionomics. No matter your industry or your station in life, you can use this perspective to make sense of trends, see around the corner, prepare, and make decisions that put you ahead of the herd. You might just find yourself reading the news or looking at stock market charts totally differently from now on as you go forward and see the world through your socionomic spectacle. Learn more about socionomics and how to apply it when you join the Socio Club. Membership is free. Visit club.socionomics.net.